Hey, it's Jim, and this is FRM Part 1, the topic on financial markets and products, and the chapter on commodity forwards and futures. Let me quickly remind you that this is the final chapter in a series on forward and futures contracts. Our focus has mostly been on financial forward and futures contracts. And by the way, uh, that first paragraph inside of this chapter tells us that because futures contracts are standardized forward contracts, this chapter treats those two terms uh, interchangeably. Now, the emphasis in this chapter uh, can be summarized in, in really just one word. Uh, the difference between financial and commodity forward and futures contracts. And to illustrate that example, I'm going to go ahead and and take off my wedding band. And by the way, 33 years ago, my wife and I, we uh, we paid $100 each for our, uh, for our wedding rings. I want you to think about if you were in a movie, let's call it Lord of the Rings, and let's suppose that you're Mr. Frodo, and uh, when you went to that council, what was that council's name? Elrond. And they gave you the ring, and they said, it's going to take you three movies and, what, seven and a half hours to take the ring from here in this beautiful, peaceful place all the way over there to that really, really bad place. In fact, at the end, you're going to get your finger bitten off. So what did Mr. Frodo have to do with this ring? He had to store it. So that's what I was saying just a few moments ago about one word. The key difference between financial forward and futures contracts and commodity forward and futures contracts is storage. Now, there's a couple other things that we'll talk about inside of this reading. But of course, someone has to bear the cost of storing. And Mr. Frodo, of course, he, he bore this huge cost. I still don't understand why everybody uh, stayed on Earth and he had to go out on that ship wherever he was going. Uh, uh, maybe you can explain that to me sometime. Uh, anyway, here are the learning objectives. So there are a bunch of them, um, but we don't have too long of a slide deck. Some of these we'll be able to get through really quickly because we've covered lots of these concepts from the financial futures market perspective. You know, we'll do some math. Notice that second one there. Yes, yeah, storage costs. And we'll talk about some other things as well. Um, there's going to be a cost of carry model. And uh, we're going to do some synthetic positions. And then uh, at the end, we'll go ahead and talk about systematic and unsystematic risk. And then normal backwardation and contango. Uh, I think... I think that last learning objective is about the most interesting from a testing perspective, but the reading only has really just one small paragraph on it. And so I'll explain that to you at the, at the very end. I regularly asked you guys to get out your phones and take pictures. So here's a good time to do that. Take a picture of this slide. And this answers that very first learning objective differences between commodity and, uh, and financial derivatives. So look over on what we know on the right hand side. No storage costs, no transportation costs. You can short and you can short pretty quickly and easily in the financial markets. Uh, these are for equity securities, fixed income securities and derivatives. And then look up at the top. You know, what are we when we buy a stock or a bond? You know, what are we doing? We're buying essentially a piece of paper that gives us a claim on some future cash flows. Commodities, on the other hand, I mean, if you read through these kind of quickly, man, we've got lots and lots of storage costs. Uh, we can have high transportation costs. Uh, shorting a barrel of oil or a gold ring is way more difficult than shorting a share of stock on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And so we call that the lease rate. So that'll be an important topic that we get to in just a few minutes. And of course, these are these are. Uh, these commodities are physical goods. Now, what the chapter does for us is identify the factors. So here, I'll just do this quickly here. So there's agricultural, there's metal, and there's uh, energy, and there's weather. So let's go back here just so you know. You can imagine some really, really good exam questions that say something like, you know, here's a commodity and it's characterized by this and this and this. Is it most likely agricultural, metal, energy or whatever like that? Does that make sense? All right. Agricultural commodities. All right. So there's the first one. Of course, it's got to be the first one. And these are storage costs. Uh, seasonality. 
Uh, you know, this is less of an issue in recent times than it was back in the old days. And when I say back in the old days, you know, I'm going to go back to when the uh, first futures contract was traded, 1848 in Chicago. I mean, seasonality was a huge deal. But now, of course, we have access to things like ships and airplanes and satellites and all sorts of things. So seasonality is not that huge of an issue, although, although it is because, you know, strawberries are grown, you know, in the eastern United States, the northeastern United States. They they're harvested, you know, sometime in May. But strawberries are grown all over the world in that particular climate. I mean, you, you never go to the grocery store and they say, oh, here are strawberries grown by Santa at the North Pole. So there's still some seasonality issues in there. Um, and the reading does emphasize harvesting time, October to November. You know, just remember the fall uh, for many of the agricultural commodities, you know, like, like wheat. Uh, weather, of course, can impact uh, demand and supply, political considerations. Um, you know, this, this is a huge issue uh, with politicians trying to get involved in making certain that we have enough food out there uh, for all of us. Your homework assignment is to just do a search for your local area and say, who controls the price of milk? And you might be surprised at uh, all the regulations about, uh, about milk. But then I think a great exam question, look at that bottom left over there, interdependence. I want you to think of yourself as a, a, a corn farmer and a sheep and cattle farmer as well. So what do you do? You know, you grow all the corn and you have a choice. Your choice is to sell it in the spot market today at a price or sell it in the derivatives market for a different price, maybe higher, maybe lower in the uh, to somebody in the future, or you could just take it over and feed your cattle and your sheep. So what happens if the price of corn goes up? Well, then, uh, then you're sacrificing if you feed your sheep by not getting that profit or those revenues by selling it in the spot or the futures market. So there's tremendous interdependence between and among all different sorts of um, agricultural commodities not least of which is that, you know, if uh, if we have weather, <laughs> then that's probably going to dampen our corn and our wheat and our soybeans and our strawberries and whatever else it is. All right. How about metal? The re the, one of the very first sentences in, in this part of the chapter is that the storage costs for metal are not nearly as substantial as they are for agriculture because you don't have to worry about, I mean, look at this. What did they do to this ring in those movies? They did everything to it, right? Until it went into the fiery molten lava, which uh, I think the word was unmade it so that we could all be free and happy and wouldn't have to worry about the bad guys anymore. You know, so what, what am I saying here? That the cost of storing gold is way less than it is to store um wheat because rats don't get in and eat uh, and eat the gold. All right, so what what are these uh, what are these factors? Industrial demand, right? So we have demand for all these sorts different sorts of metals and and by the way, you know, we have these things, these precious metals, and then we have, you know, these rare earth metals that uh, seem to be super important in the supply chain for things like uh, oh, I don't know, computers and cars and refrigerators. You know, so industrial demand, couple that with, look down at the bottom, what do we have? Actions by governments and cartels. And so, you know, the federal government could wake up today and say something like, um, you know what, every one of your dishwashers has to be made out of gold. So then what happens? You know, then all the gold miners, they're delighted to hear this new regulation. Now, of course, we're going to talk about a convenience yield in just a little bit. That's that's one part of the convenience yield, the yield associated with owning the asset rather than owning a forward or a futures contract on on the asset. Now, what was I just saying about these uh, these rare metals? Uh, you know, they're produced, uh, they're harvested, they're extracted, you know, somewhere over there. You know, so we need to worry about exchange rates as well. So remind yourself that exchange rates are determined based on the supply and demand for and between two particular currencies. 
Yeah, recycling, I always uh, am fascinated by the marriage of recycling and the golf world. The Waste Management Golf Tournament is that one tournament in the spring where they have on the, I think it's the 17th or 16th hole, we have the giant stands there and no one has to be quiet. In fact, they're probably uh, drinking uh, in the, in those stands and the golfers come and they cheer and they cheer. And then when someone hits a beautiful shot, they throw their water bottles out on the green. So it's, you know, it's pretty crazy for, for golf. But of course, you know, waste management, they're huge, uh, they're huge recyclers. Uh, investment demand. Those of you who watch golf and watch football and basketball on television, you'll know there's some, uh, you know, an, an older gentleman comes on. He was in one of those great movies in the old days. And uh, he comes on and says, you know, hello, I'm, I won't tell you his name. And whenever I have some extra money laying around, I buy gold and I buy silver. And, uh, you know, gold and silver, they're great inflation hedges, et cetera, et cetera. And then other factors, inventory levels. This was huge, um, you know, I'm going to say during COVID, but kind of after COVID. Remember, we had all those all those supply chain issues. So we have: do we have an inventory inside of our barn? Do we have an inside uh, inventory in our field, or do we have an inventory in our boat that's somewhere out there off the coast of California, and nobody knows when it's going to be able to dock? All right, so we got to worry about supply chain issues. Energy. There's the first one. There storage costs. Uh, Lots of money to store oil. That makes perfect sense. Seasonality is an issue, not because of the different harvesting times. By the way, that's a great exam question um, for the agricultural side of the forward contracts. But, you know, what do we do? You know, in the summertime, I go ahead and turn on my air conditioning, uh, which is electric. And then in the wintertime, I turn on my heat, which is gas. So I've got seasonality issues here. Yeah, geopolitical factors. I mean, this is huge. What what have we heard about, you know, there are wars going on all over this place, uh, you know, because uh, somebody wants oil, somebody wants natural, natural gas. And so we have supply chain interruptions. We have production interruptions. Uh, of course, uh, some of these contracts, some of these energy contracts, in particular oil prices, are functions of what happens with global benchmarks. So there's the example, brood, uh, Brent crude oil, West Texas intermediate crude oil. Uh, I did go to school in Texas for a long time, and I, uh, I, read, about, uh, I read about the oil market every single day of my, of my life back in those days. And then uh, weather, extreme weather events, heat waves and hurricanes can impact the demand for energy products. Just think of some of the natural disasters that we've had in which pipelines were, were broken. Uh, you can also include, you know, train derailments uh, and earthquakes and all sorts of things like that. Now, moving on to weather derivatives, th th these are really, really cool things, and they're very, very limited. And I'll explain that here in just a second. But what the chapter focuses on are uh, futures contracts in which you can either hedge or speculate based based on the temperature. And if you go to the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange webpage, you'll see a, a map of the United States and you can bet on the weather in, I forget how many cities it is, eight or 10 or 12 cities. And so you think about it, you know, if you are uh, the owner of a miniature golf course and you get all of your revenues from, let's say, uh, you know, May to September. And so when do you not, when do you not have lots of people come on your miniature golf course? Well, when the temperature is over 150 degrees, nobody wants to be outside or the temperature is under uh, zero degrees. Nobody wants to go outside. Now, of course, the exchanges, they don't, they don't set those temperatures at such extreme levels. You know, they'll probably set it somewhere, uh, somewhere in the middle. But the important thing is that, you know, there are lots and lots of businesses that suffer when, uh, temperature is high and they suffer when temperature is low. So this is a great tool for managing, managing weather related risks. Now, there ought to be, there ought to be futures contracts on things like hurricanes and tornadoes and, and earthquakes. But remember that, of course, insurance companies and probably municipalities would go ahead and, uh, and participate in this market. 
But imagine the speculators, and this is why you can't do this. You know, imagine if you took the long position in a hurricane futures contract. And so the more damage that a hurricane did to a particular uh, location, the greater would be your profitability. So, you know, think about the ethics and the morality, uh, not to mention just the human element of, you know, suppose you had the long position in a, in a Hurricane Katrina uh, futures contract. And so, you know, the hurricane is, is forming out there in, in the ocean or the uh, or wherever it formed. And, and uh, you know, as it's coming into New Orleans, you're saying, you know, come on, hurricane, come on, hurricane. And, you know, it hits there and causes massive damage to lives and he, lifestyles and businesses. And, you know, and so you benefit uh, at the expense of these other uh, of these poor uh, these poor people. So you can't have you can't have that. Now, there are there are people who who might benefit from a hurricane, maybe construction firms, you know, but the demand on both sides of the contract is probably not sufficient so that we, we probably never see a hurricane futures contract, even though, you know, in theory, it's something that would really help the insurance companies. Thank you for your patience and listening to me over the last two minutes there. All right, moving on to the next uh, learning objective, explain the formula. All right, so think about this. Here I am, I'm a, uh, I'm a corn farmer, and so I'm harvesting my corn and I can sell it to you for, let's say, five dollars a bushel in the spot market today. All right. So there's somebody over here who comes to me and says, hey, hey Jim, I want to I want to buy that. I want to buy that uh, bushel of corn, but I don't want to buy it for a month. I don't need it now. I need it in a month. So what's my choice as Jim, the farmer? I have to decide whether I'm going to sell it to you for five dollars a bushel. Or am I going to agree to sell it to this dude over here at some other price? Well, what does that other price have to reflect? There's no way I'm selling it to him for $5 in 30 days. I, I lose out, right? At least, at least by the time value of money. I mean, let's just let me quickly go back here. You know, we have all of these things. You know, here's the agriculture one. We have all, we have all of these factors. So what am I going to do? I'm going to say, look, if you want to buy my corn in, in a month, then you're going to have to pay $5.25 for the bushel because I have, let me go back here again, I have, I have all this stuff that I have to worry about. And so you're going to pay me to store it. And that's why I gave the example of, uh, of Mr. Frodo at the beginning, because while we have all these other factors out there, the cost of storage is the first one and the primary one. So what am I saying? I'm saying something like, hey, you're going to pay me more than what I can sell to uh, uh, the people over in the spot market. So how do we formalize that and put it into some kind of an equation? Well, we've got to rely on the concept of no arbitrage, which we, we've talked about at length in, uh, in previous chapters. And so what we're saying is that that forward price, the price, what did I say, $5.20 or $0.25, cents, that price has to be equal to the expected future spot price of that commodity. So I say to you guys here, all right, I can sell to you for 5 but I think the price of corn is going to go up to five twenty-five in a month. So that's the price I'm going to pick. So what are we saying here? Let's take a pause. What have we done during our lifetime here in all of these recordings? The price of any financial security is the present value of those expected or promised or anticipated cash flows. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Price and present value mean the same thing. But now, now the transaction is not occurring until sometime in the forward, sometime in the future. So the forward price or the forward price is nothing more than a future value. And that ought, that ought to make perfect sense. So look down there at the bottom orange and red box, uh, depending on whether we use continuous compounding in the orange box, uh, our futures price is equal to the future value. And we use the little uh, E to the RT. R stands for the interest rate. And by the way, that'll be the risk-free interest rate. I think I said this a couple of explanations in the previous recordings. And then moving forward, we're going to have the same conversation about option contracts. 
So we'll just go ahead and say, you know what, Jim, let's just use the risk-free rate of interest. We'll worry about that explanation in some other time. But let me just quickly say, it relates back up to the no arbitrage. So, you know, if you can have a riskless profit, right, then the risk-free rate of interest uh, ought to be ought to be used. Now, there are some other formal derivations that prove this is true. Uh, we don't need to get into those today. So there's the formula in orange with continuous compounding. There's the formula in red with discrete compounding. So just remember, the forward price or the futures price is nothing more than a future value of the spot price. So here's a good example. Crude oil, $60 a barrel, 2%, one and a half years. What is, uh, what is that forward price? Using both continuous and discrete compounding. And there you go. Uh, at a low interest rate, these things are probably going to be pretty close together. There you go. 61.83 and 61.81. At the risk of offending you, can I pause? Uh, when you're solving for, for the forward price using continuous compounding, do the exponent first. So if you have your calculator out right now, put the 0.02. And by the way, make sure you use the decimal form of the interest rate. So 0.02 times 1.5, then hit your equal sign, and then hit your e to the x button, and then multiply that by 60, and you'll get the, uh, you'll get the 61.83. Now the chapter takes us through a couple of examples. Uh, I always wonder about specific examples if they will show up on these kind of professional exams. Uh, I'm guessing since it's in the chapter that it's fair game for the uh, fair game for the exam. So here are two examples. Uh, COVID caused uh, demand decline and oversupply. Why? Because, well, we weren't doing anything. We weren't driving our car. We weren't going out and buying anything. You know, so there were uh, short forward contracts in there that made some good money. Gold forward contracts, U.S. and China trade ex escalations. Um, yeah, gold prices surged um, probably due to, the, uh, due to COVID. All right, let's go back to that conversation on uh, arbitrage. So descri describe an arbitrage transaction. Let me just quickly remind you, arbitrage means that you have to make no investment. You take no risk, but you get some positive return out of it. So there are two types of arbitrage here, cash and carry arbitrage, which we'll do right here. And then there is a reverse cash and carry arbitrage. So I'm gonna give you a really, really cool way to remember the difference between these two. Oops, I went one too many back. So the first step in both the cash and carry arbitrage is, and the reverse, is to borrow something. So with the cash and carry, your first step is you're gonna borrow cash. So remember that, borrow cash. This is called the cash and carry. When we do the reverse one, what you're going to do is you're going to borrow the asset. So you're probably going to short it. So you're going to borrow the security, borrow, borrow the asset. So when you get that first step right, then everything else just falls in place. All right, so when does cash and carry arbitrage help us? This is when the forward price is higher, higher than the expected future spot price, right? So that violates that equation that we have just a few moments and a few slides ago. All right, so here are our steps, the diamond steps. We're going to borrow cash, right, cash and carry at the risk-free rate. We're going to use that proceed to go ahead and buy the commodity at the spot. We'll then take the short position in the forward contract. What does the short position do? It, it, we agree to sell the asset that we just bought at some time in the forward because the forward price is higher, right? Of course, we want to sell at that higher price. All right, so what do we do? We store and hold the commodity and then we uh, finance the purchase and storage costs at the risk-free rate of interest. So then we settle at the, uh, at the maturity date of the contract and then we have some money left over. Oh yeah, here's the uh, here's what happens at expiration. So receive the forward, and we profit from the difference. Let's do a quick example. Here. Ready? Gold price twelve hundred per ounce. The correctly priced forward is twelve thirty six at a three percent interest rate. The mispriced 
uh, forward rate is 1250. So there's, there's a difference of 14. Keep that in mind. Risk-free rate, there's 3% one year. So let's go ahead and work through the steps. So we're going to borrow $1,200 at the risk-free. We're going to buy an ounce of gold at the spot price of $1,200, short that forward contract at $1,250. All right, so at expiration, what do we have to do? We're going to deliver that one ounce of gold that we already have. We're going to receive the forward price of $1,250. Now, remember, we borrowed $1,200 at 3%, so we got to pay the interest. There's the $1,236. So what's the difference? The difference is $14. So let me just go back here quickly. You know, we knew since we were just doing, you know, one ounce, $1,236 uh, and the $1,250, this difference was going to be the the $14. Now, on an exam, you know, maybe they'll say something like you'll buy 22 ounces of gold or use 22 ounces of gold as your base amount. Now, the reverse cash and carry, what was I saying? We're going to borrow, but we're going to borrow the asset or the commodity. So the first step is to short it. We'll take the long position in the contract there at the missed priced forward rate, which is probably going to be lower, right? Invest the proceeds uh, at the risk-free rate. And then at expiration, we just do the opposite of that example that we just had. All right, so let's do this. Current gold price, $1,300 per ounce. The correct forward price is $1,339. The mispriced forward price is the $1,250. There's 3% and one year, same, same as in the previous example. So the mispriced forward is lower than the correct forward price. So there we're going to do our reverse cash and carry. So what's our first step? We're going to borrow, right? But what are we borrowing? We're going to borrow the asset. So we short one ounce of gold for thirteen hundred dollars uh, what do we do we take the long position in a forward contract at the 1250 right so invest the proceeds so we take the 13 so we have the 13 from shorting and that's going to grow to 1339 and so the difference there is 89 dollars at expiration All right, the reading then goes into a little bit more detail on storage costs, warehousing fees, insurance, spoilage, other related costs. <laughs> Just think of everything that Mr. Frodo went through uh, during those three very, very, very long movies. And in the end, uh, I guess we all lived happily ever after. In the storage market, what does that mean? That means that in the end, even though we have things like we have to pay for insurance. We have to pay for refrigeration or for heating. So to avoid spoilage, right? Other kinds of costs, you know, maybe we need to pay uh, some, some people to stand outside of our warehouse to, uh, to make sure nobody comes in and steals it. You know, those would be included in, in warehousing fees. Now, a carry market is a definition in which the futures price of the commodity is higher than the spot price. And this makes perfect sense based on what I was saying earlier about, what did I say? The uh, bushel of corn was $5 in the spot, and it was $5.20 or $5.25 in the forward market. So this is a full carry, right? When the futures price reflects all of those costs of carrying, uh, carrying includes all that stuff up there at the top. Now, I said earlier that we would talk about the lease rate here. Um, I want you to think about this when we, uh, we borrow the commodity from the borrower's perspective, from our perspective, this represents the cost of borrowing. You know, it's kind of like the leasing rate. We know we're going to call it the lease rate, but it's an implied interest rate. So lease rate is not in dollars. It's, it's in terms of an interest rate. Here's this uh, convenience yield. Uh, my example of the convenience yield, I'll go back to that great James Bond movie, Goldfinger, from uh, the early 1960s. I'm guessing that, that most of you don't know about this movie, but the bad guy was named Arik Goldfinger, and he had tons and tons of gold. But what he planned to do is he planned to uh, explode in a small atomic device, which is what he called it, inside of Fort Knox, to make the uh, the gold supply of Fort Knox, uh, you can't go in, right? When you explode a bomb, you have to stay in there for, oh, what does James Bond say? 57 years or something like that. 
So what does that do? That makes the inventory that Goldfinger has, it increases the value of that. And so the price of that goes up and he can sell that at a higher price. You know, convenience yield. Notice the benefit or premium associated with holding the actual physical commodity rather than the some kind of a derivative. So it's a convenience. Now, of course, you have to go through the whole thing about storage. You got to store this, but it's also convenient when there's uh, when there's an increase in prices. Now, now, of course, this is an extreme example with my gold finger, but convenience yield is benefit. The convenience yield benefits the owner of the asset like a farmer. Uh, because they own the asset, if there is some kind of a reduction in supply uh, of, uh, of that particular commodity. It's a little bit more subtle than the, than the James Bond movie. All right, so let's look a little bit more detail at this lease rate. So there's a good example. So the forward, so we can use the lease rate uh, and we can use the risk-free rate to kind of come up with uh, what that forward price will be. So this is kind of a rearranged version of what we did just a little bit ago because what we're having to do now is we're having to compare the risk-free rate of interest and the, the lease rate. So look at that orange equation there. The futures or the forward price is equal to the spot price compounded at some rate. So notice that we've got the risk-free rate in the numerator and one plus because we have to reflect compounding and then the denominator one plus the least rate. So think about that. One plus R divided by one plus L, those things could be that computational result. It could be, you know, 1.05 or it could be 0.95. It could be greater than one, it could be less than one, which allows for the forward price to be either greater or less than the spot price. And of course we raise it, uh, we raise it to the T power. So look at the diamond points down there at the bottom. Um, these are good, these are good two diamond points to memorize here. In fact, get your phone out, take a picture of this. This is a, this is a great exam question. I would throw this on there. A higher lease rate reduces the forward price, reflecting the lower net cost of carry. Remember we talked about that full cost just a few moments ago. On the other hand, if the lease rate exceeds the, the risk-free rate, then the forward price could be lower. All right, so this makes perfect sense here about, uh, about this relationship between forward and spot prices. So back to my first example about the, uh, the bushel of corn. I told this person over here that I have to store the corn, so therefore, therefore I'm gonna charge you a higher price. And that's true, and that's the main driver of that higher forward price. However, there are other elements, there are more subtleties that we've talked about here. One of those is uh, one of those is the least rate. So let's look at a quick example here. Spot price of gold, 1500, risk-free rate two, uh, gold lease rate 1%, time to maturity is one year. So there you go. What is the forward uh, price of gold for a one-year contract? 1514.85. Now, down at the bottom, what we've done is we've just kind of reproven what was given to us in the question stem. But what GARP could do is they could say, here's the $1,500 spot. Here's the 1514 forward price, one year, 2% risk-free rate. What is, what is that lease rate? Or maybe they'll call it the implied lease rate. And so there's the equation to uh, to go ahead and compute the one the one percent. Now let's look at a quick example that relates the lease rate and arbitrage opportunities. Of course, of course, if we're borrowing the commodity, that has to be reflected. That cost has to be reflected in any kind of an arbitrage conversation that we have. All right, let's continue with that previous example, but suppose the actual forward rate is 1525. Now the true non-arbitrage price is 1514, so we can use that cash and carry. So what are we gonna do? Cash and carry, we're gonna borrow cash. All right, so at initiation, borrow at the risk-free rate and use that to buy gold at the $1,500 uh, per ounce price. 
we're going to lease out the gold for one year at that lease rate, right? So this leasing fee is going to be $15. And then we're going to sell the forward contract. So notice there's an extra step here when we combine the lease rate and the arbitrage opportunity. At expiration, then, we're going to deliver the gold, right, at the $1,525. So that's good. We're going to repay the loan. We borrowed the $1,500, right? So we have to repay $1,530. And so the net profit, then, is the... 1525 uh, minus the 1530, which is a minus five, right? But but the lease fee of plus the 15, that gets us to $10 of an arbitrage profit. Let's go ahead and put lots and lots of this material together. This is known as the cost of carry model, which we can use to calculate the forward price of a commodity. It includes things like, well, look at the learning objective. It includes things like storage costs. It includes things like the convenience yield. It includes things like the cost of financing and any benefits uh, that are obtained. So look at the components down there, financing cost, storage cost, and convenience yield. So there's the orange equation, what we're saying now. To combine some things that we've just recently talked about is that forward price is going to be equal to the spot price, right? That makes perfect sense. Plus, we're going to throw in the present value of all of those storage costs. That's uh, noted as uppercase U. Now, remember, the spot price, that, that's a present value. So we need to add a present value of the storage cost. So that makes sense. And then we're just going to comp compound them out at the risk-free rate of interest. Now, of course, to avoid arbitrage, we need to worry about this upper bound. And so there's the equation that, uh, that we're seeing there. Higher the storage cost, the higher the forward price will be. That, that makes perfect sense. So let's take a look at an example. Spot price, $70 a barrel, risk-free rate five, time to maturity one, present value of storage cost, $2 a barrel. Using the forward price formula, all we're really doing here. I mean, this is super simple math. We're just going to take that $2 and add it to the 70. So this equation looks an awful lot like we did, you know, in the first couple of slides here in, in this slide deck. So there you've got 7560. But let's go ahead and add the convenience yield to this. So let's think, think about this. You know, back here, all we did was we took the spot price and added the storage costs to it. Now we're going to add a convenience yield. And so this orange equation looks an awful lot like what we did before with that uh, lease rate. So the forward rate is going to be equal to the spot rate compounded by, well, depending on whether or not the risk-free rate is greater than the convenience yield. Same thing that we had back with leasing just a few moments ago. So here, what we're doing is saying that now, now using this equation, that forward price can be either higher or lower than the spot price, which is probably not true here because look, the forward price is equal to S plus U. Storage costs are probably positive, right? So that's going to be a forward price that's greater than the spot price. And that gets us somewhere, but now we need to add another layer of subtlety to this. Look at the teardrop points down there. These are probably good exam questions. Convenience yield effectively reduces the compounding factor. Uh, boy, I've given this example in my class all the time. Maybe we've heard this in a previous recording, but I want you to uh, think about my roommate and I, when we were in college, after we were studying for a while, maybe five minutes, my roommate would say, hey, it's time to go down to the uh, arcade. And we would play hours and hours of Pac-Man. So what did the Pac-Man do? Wah -uh, wah -uh, wah -uh. How's that for uh, uh, a special effect? And what did the Pac-Man do? He would eat all, of the, uh, eat all of the little dots, right? But this ratio here, what happens is that we are going ahead and we're compounding at one rate, and then we're kind of discounting, I don't want to use that word, at a different rate. So we need to consider the net effect of those two interest rates, the risk-free rate and the convenience yield. So look at the last teardrop point. Higher convenience yield leads to a lowered, lower forward price. All other factors held constant. So those are good, two good teardrop points to know.
Let's work through a quick example. $70 a barrel, 5%, one year, convenience yield of 2%. So there you go. Throw in the math, 7,205. Now, we could have easily reversed this. Risk-free rate could have been 2%. Convenience yield could have been 5%, although that's probably not too likely in market conditions. But if you would have to have done that, you would have gotten a price that's less than $70. Now, how about if we combine both of those factors, storage costs and convenience yield? Of course, we've been building up to this orange formula, and this is, I would guess, most likely the question to show up on the exam. So all we're going to do is take the S plus the U, right, and then take the ratio of those two interest rates. So there are some uh, inputs for the question stem, and you do all the math there and you get uh, 7412. What you can do is you can rearrange the formula to compute the convenience yield. There, there it is in orange. Now, the last part of this chapter goes into the concept of synthetic positions. Now, remember, this idea of a synthetic security means that you're replicating the payoffs of some financial security with some other stuff maybe a derivative, in this case, a forward contract, maybe some other kinds of things, maybe even a weather derivative that we talked about uh, earlier on. So look at the first teardrop point. Synthetic commodity position is a financial strategy that replicates the payoff without actually owning the asset. So how do we do this? Well, we go ahead and invest what the chapter calls P, and P is really just a present value, right? Discounted uh, the futures price discounted at the risk-free rate of interest. So we invest that amount and then we enter the long position in the forward or the futures contract to buy the asset for F, whatever that thing is at the time. This is a synthetic position that mimics, exactly mimics going out and buying the asset. So here's some notes, F and S and R and P, there's the present value of the futures price, and there's an S, the spot price, and there's X. And this is an interesting introduction here, the expected return from the synthetically produced trades. So back here, here's a synthetically produced trade uh, using, using annual compounding. Now, what the, what the chapter does in the previous section to this is give us a super long conversation on the capital asset pricing model and the systematic risk, all right, and then the definition of X, the expected return, is a function of the level of systematic risk inside of whatever this commodity market is. So remember X as just some kind of expected return. You might, you might think of it as whatever return that the capital asset pricing model might produce. Now, of course, we need some other input variables for the capital asset pricing model than what we would need on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So here are the cash flows at time P. What do we do? We're out the investment, the right, the present value. And then, I'm sorry, that was at time zero. We're out that investment. And then at time T, uh, we have the long position in the asset. Now, what is this expected future spot price? Hmm. Well, go down there to the bottom. All we're doing, well, actually go to the middle the orange arrow point, the expected spot price is just this present value times one plus the return on that synthetically produced position. So when you substitute in there, you get the expected spot price is equal to the relationship between that return on the ex uh, synthetically produced position and the risk-free rate of interest. That's how you create a synthetic position. Now, here's a slide on all this conversation about systematic and unsystematic risk and diversification. Let me just go through these quickly because I'm guessing you know these from before. But let's go ahead and then talk about some factors that are specific to uh, commodity markets. So systematic risk, you know, this is the, essentially the risk, the market risk, the risk of the entire market. Uh, it impacts all securities, cannot be uh, reduced 
to the point of elimination through diversification. Remember, diversification does nothing to systematic risk, but it virtually eliminates unsystematic risk. Of course, it influences both the current futures prices and those expected future spot prices. So here is probably a good question. So what, what are these systematic risk factors? And look, as you read through those, they're exactly what we talked about you know, at the beginning couple of slides. Interest rate changes, inflation, political instabil instability, major economic events, major weather events, and here's what the questions on the exam are very, very likely to show up as. Look at that last diamond point there. It is a function of the correlation between the return on the market and the underlying assets. So what are the underlying assets here? Well, in our previous discussions on capital asset pricing model and systematic risk, the underlying asset was always, you know, a share of stock. Now the underlying asset is, you know, my, my ring, my, my band of gold. So those two uh, diamond points there in the bottom, the blue and the red, these are really, really good exam questions. If the correlation is positive, then that return on the synthetic position will exceed R, right? That means that the expected spot rate is going to be above F. Now that's called normal backwardation. I'll talk about that here in just a second on the next slide. If the correlation is negative, then R exceeds that return on the synthetic position, which means that... Uh, the expected spot is below F, and that, that's called contango. So let's look at a picture of normal backwardation and contango. And this is what I was saying at the very beginning of the slide deck. This is such a cool concept here, but the, the reading gives it just, just one chapter. Now, back in the old days, when I was in graduate school, this is how I learned it, okay? So normal backwardation is when the expected spot rate is above F, the forward price. Let's look at a really cool graph here that illustrates the difference between normal backwardation and contango. Contango, isn't that a really cool word? So I want you to think about this. What these two, what the green and the red slopes, the upward slope for normal backwardation and the downward sl red slope for contango, what these things mean over time is that, notice there's the dots over there on the end for delivery date. This relies on the simple fact of uh, what's known as convergence. So th this, this thing here is, uh, you probably can't understand this unless you understand convergence. So think about this. Let's go back to my uh, corn bushel example, right? What did I say? 525 was the forward price, $5 was the spot price. So what do we know about the spot? The spot price is gonna go up or down. Could be 510, could be 490, and the forward price is gonna to adjust to that. If the spot price goes up, well then the forward price goes up. If the spot price goes down, well then the forward price is gonna go down, right? That's a derivative security. Its price is derived from the price of the underlying asset. But what happens to storage costs over time? When I came up with that 525, I was telling you that you were gonna to have to pay me 25 cents to store my corn for one month. But what happens over time to the length of storage? So after two weeks, 14 days, well, I only have to store this for 14 more days or 16 days, how many days are in a month? So after 14 days, my storage costs decline. So the storage costs decline, right? The, all the other costs decline as well. So that on the maturity date of the forward contract, the spot price and the forward price are the same price because there are no, any, uh, there are no other costs out there. Essentially, the spot market and the forward market become the same market. Think about this. I have a bushel of corn and I can sell it in the spot market for, let's just pick a different number. I can sell it for $6, but there's a forward market over there that matures in 30 seconds. How long, how much does it cost me to store corn for 30 seconds? I don't know, I guess I could hold it here and I could charge you for you know my muscle, uh, my muscle use, but in 30 seconds, we're gonna have the same price, especially when it gets down to 10 seconds and five seconds and zero seconds. All right, so do you understand that concept of convergence? That's why we have the upward slope on the green and the downward slope on the red. All right, so here we are in our conversation of normal backwardation. 
And all the reading does is say, let me go back here, normal backwardation is when uh, the expected spot is above the forward price, okay? So there we go. And there, what's happening over time that, here, let me go back to that previous one, that expected spot and that forward, they're going to converge, right? And so there we have, we have that upward slope. Now, the only thing that the reading does is say that, hey, you know what? Some people interpret this as normal backwardation is where not just the expected spot is above the forward price, but when the current spot is above the forward. And so they kind of use that interchangeably. The way in the, the two diamond points there, this is the way I learned it in graduate school. This is the way I, that I always remember it. So that don't worry about whether it's the expected spot or the spot. I don't think the reading is really distinguishing between those two, but look down at that bottom arrow point. You ready for this? Hedgers. So who, who are the hedgers? I'm, I'm Jim the farmer, right? So I need to hedge. So what am I doing? I'm taking lots and lots of short positions in the forward market. So what am I doing? I am very, very active as a hedger in the forward market. So when I'm shorting in a month or six months, I'm doing lots and lots of selling. So if I'm doing lots and lots of selling, what happens to the price? The price falls. So there we go. Hence, driving down futures prices. Now, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is contango, when the futures prices are higher than the expected spot price. And this, uh, this occurs uh, when just the opposite is happening here. Let me go back here real quick. So the hedgers are more active than speculators when we have normal backwardation, but with contango, the speculators are more active in hedgers. So this is a really interesting concept. Notice that one of those, the, the third arrow point talks about seasonal variations and expected changes in supply and demand. And this of course has all implications for uh, supply chain. Um, but this is what I tell my students about the difference between normal backwardation and contango is that, yes, you have a battle between speculators and hedgers. And if hedgers dominate, then probably one thing is going to happen. And then I put a, a comma after that and I say, wait a minute, you know, let's suppose that I'm Jim and I'm hedging my corn, right? And I'm hedging tons and tons of forward contracts. But what about General Mills? General Mills, they buy my corn so that they can make Count Chocula. Well, they're hedging and they're taking the opposite position in the forward market. So I tell my students that, of course, it depends on what hedgers and speculators are doing, but it depends on the magnitude of the hedgers on one side and the hedgers on the other side. You know, think about Think about the oil producers like ExxonMobil and airlines like Southwestern Air. All right, so, you know, these two businesses, they are both hedging in the forward and the futures market. Are they always going to be equally hedging? Is their demand for the hedge going to be the same? And the answer is probably not. And so whichever one is bigger, you're going you're gonna to end up in contango or normal backwardation. So you really don't need... You really don't need speculators to come up with contango or normal backwardation. But then again, what speculators are doing, they're just saying something like, hey, you know what? I think the price of corn is going to go up or I think the price of corn is going to go down. I don't own the asset. I don't want to own the asset. I don't need to own the asset. I'm just going to use my econometric model over here to jump in and try to take advantage of my directional uh, expectations for the market. Now, having said all that, I gave you that last five minutes of stuff so that you kind of get a better sense of what these two things mean. But if you go to the end of the reading, what you'll find is what I believe are really, really simple 20, uh, 20 questions. So what I want you to do is I want you to take, you know, 25 or 30 minutes or so and work through some of those problems. You know, the first handful are just definitional, so you ought to be able to whiz right through those. And then the last couple, you have to use your calculator for a little bit, but I, I think you'll do okay based on what we've talked about. So, hey, thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day and good luck studying.